vertical student ministry, what we're going to do? Yeah, yeah it's supposed to be build it, okay, every, all week long, and y'all had your opportunity right there. Okay, all right. Vertical student ministry, what are we going to do? Build it! All right, there we go. Incredible camp this week. Uh, had uh, nine people saved uh, uh, at camp uh, with our, our group, nine uh, were saved. That, yeah, you should be clapping right now. Uh, and a uh, lot other incredible decisions. And watching, watching you guys worship uh, absolutely uh, blew me away. I love it. I love it. I love it. And so, so good uh, to be uh, a part of that week for sure. Uh, I am, as you probably already know this about me, I have 11 grandchildren, and I am absolutely head over heels, crazy, madly in love with all 11 of my grandchildren. My, my relationship with them, my affection for them is completely over the top. There's no doubt about it. Now, I have six children, right? And I have four boys and, I have, and two daughters, and my daughters, right, I will kiss them on their forehead. Uh, I will occasionally kiss them on the cheek. I've got sons, and I kiss them on their forehead, on their cheek, but it's not a, uh, very often. I'm just, I'm just saying, all right? My wife, I kiss her. That ain't none of your daggone business, all right? Uh, but my grandkids, I kiss them continuously. I saw three of them in the hall just a little while ago, right before this service started, and I kissed all over them. They are cute. They are cuddly. They, they're almost edible. <laughs> Does any grandparent know what I'm talking about, right? I mean, you just, you like, man, I just want to eat you, right? And I do. I bite them. I mean, you know, and I, I kiss all over their uh, they've got the cutest little feet on the planet, right? They got chubby little uh, necks and cheeks. Uh, I give raspberries on their belly. Come on, grandparent. You know what I'm talking about? Man, I pick that belly up. Man, I said, give me some belly, you know? And I kiss all over that, give raspberries on their little bellies. I give them giant squeeze hugs. It is so awesome. If I tried to kiss any other kid like that, I would be arrested. Yeah. And should be. Let's go ahead and clarify that right quick, right? And should be, right? I mean, literally, I should be. Uh, the reason I kiss my grandkids like that is because of our relationship. Because I have a love for them that I cannot contain. And listen to me very carefully. My expression of love is a natural byproduct of my love for them. You get that, right? Every parent knows what I'm talking about. Every grandparent definitely knows what I'm talking about. Your expression of love toward them is just a byproduct of your love for them. So we started a series a month ago, and we started a series called The Wonder of Worship, right? And I've been trying to literally give you a biblical uh, mandate of what worship looks like because I believe the church is confused, right, and doesn't really understand what worship is. I'm going to worship service. Ah, you know, no, that's not what worship is. I'm, I sing. That's not what worship is. It's a part of worship, but it's not what worship is. And so we've been talking about it for a month, right? So if you haven't been here, you're watching online for the first time, you're here today for the first time, let me encourage you to go and listen to the rest of them because even though all of them stand alone, they're all connected, right? And so today we're going to see a demonstration of love. We're going to see an expression of of love because listen worship is an expression of my affection worship is an expression of my affection just like my affection toward my grandkids is a byproduct of my love for them my worship is an expression of my love for Jesus. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 7. If you have a Bible or you can just kind of look up here on the screen with me, here we go. Luke chapter 7. It's a little bit more reading than I like to normally do, but this is such a beautiful story. Listen carefully. Then one of the Pharisees, right, the religious elite of the day, right, the prim and proper religious guys, asked Jesus to eat with him. 
And Jesus went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, I'll explain that later, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw this, he spoke to himself saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Can I just, can I just stop right here? Because I'm getting fired up already. Listen to me carefully. If Jesus ever leans in and says, hey, there's something I want you to hear. There's something I want to say to you. You better be all ears. Because Jesus said, and, and he responded, hey, teacher, bring it. Greek word there bring it there was a certain he tells a parable there was a certain creditor who had two debtors one owed 500 denaria one owed 10 million and the other owed 100 bucks pretty much and when they had nothing with which to repay he freely forgave them both tell me therefore which of them will love him more Simon answered, well, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Oh, I can't wait to tell you about this. All right. So every Sunday, if you're new to new season, I give you a big idea, right? Okay. Here's the big idea. Listen carefully. The greater the intimacy of our relationship with Jesus, the more passionate our worship will be. That is true in the physical, natural world, and that is true in the spiritual world. Do you understand that? The greater the intimacy of our relationship with Jesus, the more passionate our worship will be. Now, this passage literally teaches us about 30 things about worship, right? I'm probably going to give you five or six, but this passage, I could have done an entire series on Luke chapter 7 and probably should have, right? I mean, literally, it tells us so much about worship, all right? Let me just give you a few. You ready? Watch this. Oh, my goodness. Worship is vulnerability and humility. That's why most people don't worship. Because worship takes vulnerability and it takes humility, right? Watch what Jesus said. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil, all right? Now, listen very carefully. First of all, we have a woman, all right? Now, 2,000 years ago, ladies, listen to me carefully. 2,000 years ago, women were just a piece of property, okay? Jesus did more to elevate women than anybody ever even thought about doing so, all right? And so we got 2,000 years ago, we got women who literally were just a piece of property. So she's a 
woman, right? And then the Bible says she's a sinful woman, right? She's a sinner. The Greek word for that literally means that she had a lifestyle that was uh, like a prostitute, okay? So she literally sold her body. She was a prostitute, but she's gotten right, and she's now no longer doing that, but she is a sinner, right? And she's at a Pharisee's house, right? You remember who a Pharisee is in the Bible, right? The religious uh, elite, the people that literally walked around with rulers in their hand, measuring everybody's sin and making sure that you measured up to their standard. We got a lot of Pharisees today, right? They walk around and look and see, hey, do you measure up? Hey, do you literally hey, act like I act, look like I act, vote like I vote, and do everything like I do? And if you don't, then I look down upon you. And so she's an uninvited guest in the Pharisee's house, and she just walks in. All right, we had a party at my house yesterday, my grandson's uh, sixth birthday party. And then we had uh, a bunch of, uh, you know, family and people in. And so last night we ate dinner, and there's probably like, I don't know, 15, 16 of us at our table, and we're eating spaghetti from that my wife cooked, and we're all having a good time. Can you imagine being at your house tonight, having dinner with a, your whole entire family, and then some lady just walk up in your house and sit at your table and start eating. Can you imagine? That's kind of what's happening here, right? This uninvited lady just shows up and walks into this Pharisee's house, right? But this woman teaches you and I something so big in worship. It's all right to take a risk when you worship Jesus. It's okay, right? That Listen, you can be vulnerable, that you can have humility, that you can give up control, control freaks, You can actually give up control and not care what everybody else thinks. That's the problem, right? We care so much about what everybody else thinks. What would that person think in my worship? You see, our worship should be an, an expression of love to the one who has loved us so very much. I know, watch this. Worship always costs you something. If you were here a month ago when we started this series, and I know you remember because I talked about Abraham, you say, Pastor, I can't remember what I ate yesterday, okay? All right, so a month ago, right, we talked about Abraham and right, offering the sacrifice. That's what worship is, a sacrifice, right? And so literally, worship ought to cost you something. Watch what it cost her. When she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil, all right? Now, this particular perfume ointment was worth about a year's wages. Now, think about that. Think about your salary for an entire year, all right? Now, she gave up her lifestyle of being a prostitute, okay? So maybe this was her life savings. So maybe, maybe she was going to live on this for the rest of her life. Uh, who knows, right? But she takes a year's worth of wages And literally brings it at the feet of Jesus and anoints his feet. Worship should always cost you something. The book of Exodus teaches you and I that you should never worship God. You should never sacrifice to God that it doesn't cost you anything. As a matter of fact, it says don't you come empty handed when you sacrifice to God. David said this in 2 Samuel, I won't offer anything to the Lord that doesn't cost me something. They try to give him the piece of land because he was the king. He said, "Uh uh-uh, I'm paying for it. I'm not offering anything to God that doesn't cost me something. And so your love for Jesus ought to cost you something. Her love for Jesus knew no bounds. It cost her everything she had. And everything she had, she didn't care because worshiping Jesus was the priority, which leads me to the next thing, worship is extravagant. Worship's extravagant. I mean, imagine the depth of this woman's tears being enough to clean the dirty and nasty feet of Jesus. I read this last night over in my mind and prayed over it, and I wept as I thought about her weeping over the fact that she, her tears Wash the feet of Jesus. Imagine the gratitude that she had that moved her to literally boldly display her devotion and adoration at Jesus 
and she didn't care. With tears flowing from a sobbing heart, oh, I'm so grateful for what he has done. She washed Jesus' nasty feet. He was Jesus, but he still had nasty feet. She takes his oil from the alabaster box, right? This, this flask of oil, a year's worth of wages, and she literally pours it on his feet. That's extravagant, right? So a month ago, I prepared this sermon. Matter of fact, I had this series done before I actually started this series, okay? You understand that? I, I like to be ahead. And when I was studying this, I went extravagant, so I wanted to find out what the dictionary said about what it means to be extravagant. So think about this dictionary and put it in the area of worship. Listen to this. Webster says that extravagant is exceeding the limits of reason, lacking in moderation, right? Balance and restraint, right? Extreme or excessive elaborate, spending much more than necessary, in parentheses, grandchildren, not knowing where to draw the line, grandchildren, right? That's extravagance, right? And that's what he's talking about. Now, make the, put that in worship, right? We need to learn how to be extravagant in our worship. We need to lavish love on him. We need to be elaborate in our offering of admiration. Our worship should be over and above and over the top. It ought to be extravagant. It ought to go past the limits. Let me ask you a question. How's your worship toward him? Are you over generous with your worship? Or do you sit there like this? Go ahead, bless me if you can. Or the better one is, let me drink my coffee. Or let me count the light bulbs. Did you know there's 47 light bulbs in Worship is a verb. Action. Worship should be action. It's an active expression of our love toward God. And so we got to learn. See, here's the problem. Some of you are so busy trying to save face that you're not caught up in his face, his presence, and you don't care about what anybody else thinks. Worship is extravagant. Now, now watch this. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited Jesus in saw this, he spoke to himself saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this was touching him. She, she's a sinner. And so here's this, this Pharisee. She's a sinner. Listen to me very carefully. This may offend some of you. But if the shoe fits, religious people don't understand worship. Re religious people don't get it. I I've had people say to me, many people, unfortunately, over the 15 years of New Season Church, hey, I, I didn't like it. I said, man, really? I'm sorry, man. Here's what they said, most of them. I really like the sermon. Well, great. You got half a brain. I really like the sermon, but God, look, look, the music, man, it was loud. It was, it was boisterous. People, I don't like all that clapping and all that hand waving and all that. I don't like all that. You're going to be miserable in heaven. <laughs> miserable. Read the Bible. It's a loud, noisy, boisterous place. It amazes me how you can, on the outside, get so excited about all the things of football and baseball and kids and grandkids and how you applaud and how you get excited, how you high-five a total stranger at a game. Amen. You act like a wild Indian on the outside, and then you come in here and act like a wooden one. I don't like all that. Remember, worship isn't about you. God likes it a lot, and I'll prove it to you today. Listen carefully. 
The statement that this Pharisee makes, listen, 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 good night, listen. It shows his evaluation of Jesus. Well, if he, if he, if he, if he was a prophet, if he was a man of God, he, he would have known better. Huh. He didn't know who Jesus really was. Listen, then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? Man, when I entered your house, you didn't give me any water for my feet, but she's washed my feet with the tears she wiped with her hair. Listen, you didn't give me any water for my feet. That's customary. 2,000 years ago, everybody wore sandals. Your feet got dirty and nasty, right? And so when you entered somebody's house, maybe not the host, but you had somebody there to wash your feet. It was customary. And so Jesus says, listen, I showed up. You didn't even wash my feet. You, 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 you didn't greet me with a kiss. I've, I've been to 30 different countries, and I can think of three countries right now that when you go to, as soon as I see the people, they... Give me a kiss on each cheek, men and women. And it's awkward. I ain't going to lie. A man kissing, you know. <laughs> and if you're a man, if you don't think it's awkward, you need to make an appointment with me. We need to talk, okay? <laughs> you got a whole set another different kind of a problem, all right? But we can help you. We really can. Do you know what happened to this guy? Listen to me carefully because it's happened to you. He had a low evaluation of who Jesus was. And when you have a low evaluation of who Jesus is, then you don't worship, all right? Could it be that one reason we don't worship Jesus is our evaluation of him is incorrect? Could it be that you don't realize who he is? He is God. He is God in a body. He, he is the creator of the universe, right? Or could it be that you're too dignified to worship? Pharisee, right? You can see him, right? He's smug. He's pious, right? He's too dignified to worship. Huh. Uh, uh, my position as a Pharisee. Who do you identify with more in worship? Do you identify with the Pharisee more or do you identify with the woman? You see, the greater the intimacy of our relationship with Jesus, the more passionate our worship will be. Watch this. Jesus says, let me, let me tell you how I'm going to answer this. I'm going to give you a parable like he does so brilliantly, right? Jesus said, I'm going to give you a parable. And I'm only going to read one verse. I already read all of it earlier. Jesus said, man, there was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 in the area, the other 50. So Jesus tells this story, right? Jesus says, hey, listen, there were two guys, and they owed a bunch of money, right? One guy owed 10 million. The other guy owed only about like 100 bucks. And the creditor came to both of them and said, hey, you know what? Your $10 million debt, done, gone, wiped away. You ain't got to worry about it anymore. Can you imagine how you'd respond? The same way you'd respond if you won the lottery. If you won the lottery, right, come on, if you had the ticket and you won and you just won $100 million or $200 million, this, this, this is what some of you would do. Oh, that is so nice. <laughs> Nobody would do that. You would scream, you would dance, you would shout, and you would give 10% to New Season Church. Hallelujah. <laughs> And Second Opinions, chapter 3, says you give 10% to the pastor as well, okay? <laughs> That's right next to Second Hesitations. <laughs> they got forgiven, right? And so Jesus gives a basic teaching, right? The greater the forgiveness, the greater the love. Or really, really, the greater the understanding of your forgiveness, the greater the love. Could it be that besides having a low evaluation of Jesus, that you're not understanding how much you've been forgiven? Do you understand that you deserve death, hell, and judgment and separation from God? You understand that, right? And then he reached down and saved you and forgave you, and now Christ lives inside of you, and now you're on your way to heaven? 
So the next time that you're sitting smug and pious, dripped in your religious demeanor, and you're sitting next to some emotional sinner, you know, that person that you have no idea where they've been. You have no idea the depth of sin and junk and filth that I'm getting ready to get crazy. You have no idea they used to beat their wife. You have no idea the drugs and the alcohol and the hell. And Jesus Christ reached down out of that pit and took them out of that. And now they are fired up. I'd rather sit next to an emotional sinner saved by grace than a religious, pious person dripped in your religious demeanor. Don't expect everybody to understand your worship, especially if it's extravagant. Hmm. Let me tell you something else. Worship overwhelms Jesus. Do you know that this is the only place in the Bible, the only place in the Bible where Jesus says somebody has demonstrated love toward him? Except, of course, his father, a human being. The only place, and that's gigantic. The only place in the entire Bible that Jesus says a human being has demonstrated love toward me. And he's overwhelmed by it. Does your worship overwhelm Jesus? Does your worship get heaven's attention? Does your worship excite heaven? Because the greater the intimacy of our relationship with Jesus, the greater the expression will be. Now listen carefully. There are many expressions of worship we find here in this text. I just gave you a few. And then all through the Bible, there's expressions of worship. God has created you and I to worship. Our entire being and bodies are programmed to worship. Do you understand that? All right, you ready? God gave you hands to clap and feet to stomp. God built in a percussion instrument into your body. You sing, God built in a wind instrument into your body. You were created by God to worship. So I'm going to give you some expressions, okay? All right, you ready? One, one expression, singing. All right, you ready for this? Are you all ready? In the Bible, singing is an imperative. It's a command. So if you don't sing, you're disobedient. Dang. Matter of fact, singing is a command of God. If you're not, if you don't sing, you're not filled with the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 and 19. So you're disobedient and you're not filled with the Spirit if you come to church and you don't sing. It's in the Bible. I can give you, well, I'll give you a bunch, okay? Oh, I'm going to give you a bunch. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim the good news of his salvation. Sing praises to the Lord who dwells in Zion. Sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his, and give thanks. That's an imperative. That's a command. Sing to God, you kingdoms of the earth. Oh, sing praise to the Lord. Selah. You know what Selah means, right, in the Bible? It means, mm, whew, think about that. That's what it means. So when you're reading the Psalms and you're reading Selah, then you stop and go, mm, phew, think about that. Wow, that's what it means. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Did you hear that? It's okay to sing new songs. Now, I know some of you love those old songs. I love the old songs. I, I, I really do. I love the hymns. I, I love all of it. And we do, we do them here. 
we may jazz them up a little bit, amen. <laughs> but we still sing them. But it's okay to sing new songs, for he has done marvelous things. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises to his name, for it is pleasant. If your mouth is singing, but your heart is disengaged, it's not worship. Do you understand? Your heart has to be engaged. All right, listen. I'm the worst singer, I guarantee you, in this building. I am tone deaf, right? I wear a hearing aid for those of you that are new. I don't hear well. I take this hearing aid out, I'm practically deaf, okay? So I don't hear well. I'm surely, I am tone deaf. They recorded me up there. They recorded me singing on the front row and let me listen to it. It sounded like a dying dog. <laughs> I, 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 I never, I, I didn't even believe it was me. And they said, Pastor, this is you. My grandchildren, I'm not making this up. I sing in the car, my grandchildren, I'm not making this up. They say, G-Daddy, G-Daddy, please stop. <laughs> Grandkids, stop. That, that, that's bad, okay? I cannot sing. But the Bible says to make a joyful noise. I make a noise. You better read the Bible. Hey, it says, sing unto the Lord, making melody. You ready what it says? In your heart. I am on perfect tune in my heart. Amen. Not so much outwardly, but inwardly. You see, we don't sing because we have good voices. We sing because we have a good God. You ought to sing. Shouting is an expression. Shh. Shouting. The Hebrew word is shabak, right? Shout. Uh, clap your hands, all you people. Shout to God with a voice of triumph. Huh. Numbers. I love numbers. The Lord is God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. Do you remember Joshua, the Old Testament, Joshua chapter 6? Remember how they went around Jericho? Come on, somebody, seven times. You remember what they did at the very end? Somebody help me. They, they shouted. And then what happened? The walls came down. So many other scriptures that I'm not going to give you about that. But you know what shouting does? Shouting declares to the world that the king is among us. Clapping is an expression. Huh. Clap your hands, oh, you people. That's a command. It's an imperative. God commands you to clap your hands. You may not be able to play an instrument. You may not be able to sing with a great voice, but God has designed you and equipped you. Literally, your bodies as instruments of praise and worship. I can stomp with the best of them and clap. I may not be like on key when I clap. Uh-oh, this one's going to mess some of you up. Raising your hands is an expression. The Bible says in the book of Nehemiah, and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered amen and amen. Why they lifted up their hands. The, the word... Uh, is yada, to throw up the hands, to lift up the hands. It's also, in many scriptures, an imperative. Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry to you, when I lift up my hands toward your holy sanctuary. I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. That's an imperative. That's a command. My hands also I will lift up to your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statues. Let my prayer be set before you as incense, to lifting up my hands as the evening sacrifice. Let us lift our hearts and our hands to God in heaven. I desire, therefore, New Testament, the Apostle Paul said, I desire, therefore, that, the, that men pray everywhere, lifting up 
holy hands. Paul said, I wish that all you men would lift up your hands and bless the Lord. Dancing is an expression. We did that the first uh, week, right? We had, we had a dance team if you were here, you know. Can Christian people dance? Some can and some can't. <laughs> right? I love watching children. Have you ever watched children in a restaurant? Anytime music comes on, what do they immediately do? They start dancing, right? Little kids are, are, are inhibited. That's how we should be. You hear music, you should, hey, right? You start, start feeling it, all right? Let me just give you a few Dancing is an expression. Oh, I thought it was up there. Then Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took the timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. Let them praise his name with the dance. This ain't footloose. <laughs> Let them dance. You have turned for me my morning into dancing. Praise him with the timbrel and the dance. A time to weep, a time to laugh, and a time to mourn, and a time to dance. Kevin Costner quoted this verse in Footloose. Kevin Baker. Ke Kevin Baker. What did I say? I just said that to make sure y'all are paying attention. <laughs> Kevin, Kevin Bacon. And the new one, the new one was filmed here in Hiram. Y'all know that? You shall again be adorned with tambourines and shall go forth in dances of those who rejoice. That's what dancing was. It was rejoicing. Dancing is, is a symbol of rejoicing. You're happy. You're excited. You, you dance for joy. Do you remember David, King David in the Old Testament? Do you remember when he danced? He wanted the Ark of the Covenant to come to Jerusalem. The Ark of the Covenant is a symbol of the presence and power and glory of God, right? And it was with the Philistines, and it's a long story, but he wanted it to be in Jerusalem. And a lot of things happened. People got killed for touching it wrong and carrying it wrong and all that, and David's all messed up. Finally, the presence and power and glory of God come into Jerusalem, the Ark of the Covenant. And you know what the Bible says? When David saw it, you know what he did? He danced. Matter of fact, you know what the Bible says? Now, you ought to read it because some of y'all don't know this. He took off his robe, got in his skivvies, and danced before the Lord. Do you know what the Bible says? That his wife was embarrassed by it. This is in the Bible. His wife, Michael, was embarrassed by it. And she said, you're a king, and you're acting so undignified. This is in the Bible. And you know what David said? He said, hang on, sister. It's going to get a whole lot more undignified than this. <laughs> the presence of God is in the place. And he began to dance. And you know what the Bible says about that wife of his? She never bore any children. Well, that's a whole nother sermon by itself. I wonder if he never went to the bedroom again after that. Hmm. Playing an instrument is an expression. Man, I wish I could play an instrument. I got, I got a kid that can play the drums. I got a kid that can play the guitar. Instruments. All these were under the direction of their father uh, for the music in the house of the Lord with cymbals, string instruments, and harps. Indeed, it came to pass when the trumpeters and the singers were as one, make a sound, be heard, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And he stationed the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals, with string instruments, and with harps. Then David and all the house of Israel played music before the Lord, all kinds of instruments. Then David and all of Israel played music before God with all their might. Then David spoke to the leaders of the Levites to appoint their brethren to be singers accompanied by instruments of music. Isn't it funny that some denominations actually teach that you're not supposed to have any music in church? I wonder, they, they, didn't, they must not have read the Bible. All these musical instruments. And then Revelation 14 too. So 
you're going to have musical instruments in heaven. Why wouldn't we have musical instruments now? I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters. That means it was loud. And like the voice of a loud thunder is loud in heaven. Nobody in heaven going, shh. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. Going to be lots of musical instruments in heaven. The Hebrew word is zamar, by the way. It means to play an instrument. All right. I, w- I want to tell you that you probably don't know this. Do you know who the lead worship leader is here at New Season? I bet you you wanted to say out loud or in your mind, you said, well, Josh, right? Josh Lawless, he's our lead worship leader here. But Josh, he isn't. He's second. Let me tell you who the lead worship leader is at New Season. Me. I'm, I'm the senior pastor. I'm the, I'm the priest of the Old Testament, right? I lead in worship, and I don't sing, and I don't play an instrument. But I'm the lead worship leader. So I'm going to lead you right now in some expressions, okay? We're going to start off slow and easy. For some of you, it's going to be a stretch. So right now, I'm going to ask all of you, it's a command of God, to clap. All right, one, two, three. Let's all just clap. Wow. That was, that was pretty awesome, y'all. You, you just worshiped the Lord. This is my buddy, Jason. Jason, how many instruments do you play? At least five. At least, he plays at least five instruments. He plays electric guitar. He can be on the bass. He can be over here. I mean, five instruments. I don't even know if I could count how many keys are on there, okay? I mean, this guy can play five. That's a gift of God, right? And by the way, just listen to it. It's soothing, right? Do you remember the remember Saul in the Old Testament? Do you remember what it says that when 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 David played the harp, it, it literally got rid of his demons. The, the Bible's a good book, y'all. You, you can read it, right? Isn't that soothing? Worship the Lord through instruments. What about singing? I did something at 9 o'clock. My wife doesn't even know this. I did something at 9 o'clock that I've never done in my entire life and probably will never, ever do again. I led in singing today, Vic, at the 9 o'clock hour. And I just told you I'm tone dead. So I'm going to lead you right now in a song. I want all of us to sing together, okay? It's one that we all know. We're going to sing it, and I'm going to start it. Don't leave me hanging by myself. (laughs) If you leave me by myself, we're going to exercise excommunication, okay? (laughs) As a matter of fact, you can turn me down a little bit when I start, okay? All right, so here we go. So great song that we all know. You ready? It's called Amazing Grace. One, two, three. next one going to be a stretch. This will be the last one. Raising your hands. Why don't we raise our hands in church? Why? 
It's awkward. Be honest, right? It's a little awkward. Especially if you've never done it before. I mean, it's, it's awkward. Matter of fact, you love, this is the one that you liked when they were teaching us, you know, the hand raising one, right? Some of you really, you really like that one. All right, the Hebrew word is yada, right? It means to throw up the hands. Now, with the guys who did a great job teaching us, but in, in, in the Hebrews, lifting up your hands was always like this, not this, but this. Surrender. God, I come to you with nothing, but my hands are open, I wanna receive. Because if my hands are closed, I cannot give or receive anything. Surrender. Why, why, don't, we, why don't we raise our hands? Why? Because we feel hypocritical, right? I mean, you're sitting next to maybe a spouse or a girlfriend or a boyfriend and they know you. They know you cussed yesterday. They know you lost your temper. And so you feel like a hypocrite. Well, guess what? We're all hypocrites. Welcome to the club. We're all hypocrites, especially the people stand up here. <laughs> We're the biggest ones. Because we tell you what to do and then we do the opposite. That's called hypocritical. We're all hypocrites. So now that we're all in the same boat, Maybe you've never done this before, but I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna lead you. It's maybe awkward for some of you, maybe the first time ever in church, but I want you to, I want you to lift up your hands. Wow, look at that. Just don't, just don't do it because I said it, do it and think about it. He's worthy to be worshiped to be adored, to be honored. I stand in awe of the creator of the universe that spoke the word and the world came into existence. Wow, you can put your hands down. Man, maybe that was your first time. Don't let it be your last. It's okay. I bless you. What happens when you go to the game? What, what happens when you're watching the Braves play? Okay, they're playing so good right now. And man, you're watching them. And listen, if you're at the game, you high five strangers, right? What do you do? Your hands are raised. What happens when somebody scores a touchdown? Your team, what's the first thing you do? Exactly. You raise your hands. But you can't do it in here. It's an expression of worship. It's okay. All right. Let me, I, oh God, I got to be done. All right, I'm done. Listen. What happens when people that don't know God come to church and they observe our worship? What kind of view of God do they get? Think about this for just a minute. You come into church and nobody says a word. It's quiet. It's reverent if you want to use that word, it's dead. Would they concur that God is old and stoic and stuffy and God is mean and solemn and hard and unfriendly and unforgiven? Would they, would they look at our worship and say, God doesn't like people? Or would they look at our worship and say, you know what? God is loving and good and exciting and forgiving and even approachable, right? If I had, oh, if I had time, I'm just going to tell you this and I'm done. I'm going to give you some takeaways right now. Our worship shows the world how valuable God is. Did you hear what I just said? Our worship shows the world how valuable our God is. And He is so valuable. All right, I got more to say about that, but let me just give some takeaways. Unexpressed love is no love at all. Unexpressed love, it's like buying a Hallmark card and just signing your name to it. No, you got to add a little some juice into it. You know what I mean? I mean, it's got to unexpressed love. Hey, I love you. Uh, but I'm never going to 
touch you, but never going to kiss you, never going to. Unexpressed love is no love at all. We do not have a reserved, stoic, hard father. He is demonstrative and extravagant, and I can prove that to you from Genesis to Revelation. He's not stoic and he's not hard. He's not mean. He's good and kind and loving and demonstrative. If you don't think he's demonstrative, look what he did to his son on a cross. That's demonstrative and extravagant. The greater the intimacy of our relationship with Jesus, the more passionate our worship will be. If you're in love and you're married, throw that married part in there. If you're in love, if you're in love, you're married, and you're, you're intimate with your spouse, intimacy breeds passion. That's why, that's why, that's why, that's why young people, you got to be careful. You start kissing, you start, you know, that tongue getting in somebody else's mouth. Come on. Before you know it, all right, come on, somebody. Come on. The more intimate, the more passion. The greater the intimacy of our relationship with Jesus, the more passion our worship will be. So, God wants to have a relationship with you. He's not mean. He's not got his arms crossed. He's not pointing at you and going, well, I'm mad at you because what you did, I'm mad at you. That's not who he is. His arms are wide open, and he says, I love you. I want to save you. I want to forgive you. I want to change you. I don't care what you did last night. I don't care what you did last week. I don't care what you did 10 years ago. I care about you today, and I want to save you and forgive you. That's you. He's knocking. So today, you get to say yes to Jesus. You get to invite him into your life. You, you, today, you can be saved. He loves you. God loves you so much that he sent his son, Jesus. They laughed at him. They spit at him. They mocked him. He died on the cross. He was buried. He rose from the dead, and he wants a relationship with you. And he's not going to force it, not going to push it, but he's going to invite you to come. I hope you'll say yes. Let's pray together. Heads bowed, eyes closed. In this quiet moment. Pastor, I'm saved. I love Jesus. But my worship, my intimacy has just not been there. My passion has waned. And come on back. Worship him. Love shows expression. Maybe you're here today, you're watching online, and you're not a Christian. You don't know Jesus. You don't know right now that if you died, you'd go to heaven. You don't know that your sins have ever truly been forgiven. You don't know that Jesus lives inside of you. You can make that decision today and settle it once and for all. Eternity's too long to be wrong. Go ahead and settle that issue right now. I'm going to pray a prayer right now, and you get to pray with me. You can invite Jesus to come and do your heart and life and save you. Your sins can be forgiven right now today. And if that's you, I want you to pray this prayer with me. As I say it out loud, just say it in your heart. If you want to give your life to God, pray this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, just say it to him. Jesus, God, I, I know that I need you. I know that I've sinned against you. And I'm sorry. I am willing to turn away from my sin and turn to you. I believe you died for me, that you rose from the dead. And right now, I'm willing to give you my heart and my life. Save me, forgive me, change me. Thank you, God, for hearing my prayer. We are so excited that today you decided to join us online. We hope today that you were encouraged and blessed by the Word of God and encouraged today to walk with God in a deeper, more intimate way. For some of you, you just prayed 
that prayer with us. You just invited Jesus Christ to come into your heart. And if you prayed that prayer and you meant it, do you realize that Jesus just saved you? Your sins just got forgiven. And that is the greatest thing in all the world. Matter of fact, the Bible says that all of heaven throws a party because you just said yes to Jesus Christ. And so we want to encourage you to read the Bible, to pray, to find you a, a church home that you may be involved in, or even on this online campus we've got going on here. Or I want to encourage you, if you just prayed that prayer, to let us know about that. Matter of fact, you can text your response to 470-509-5139. I want to encourage you to do that right now. Don't wait. You don't have to think about it. If you just pray that prayer, text that response to us and let us know, and then we will get back with you and help you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Again, thanks for watching us online.